Imagine the sun rising over the sea straits that bestowed Norway its name. This narrow passage was the birthplace of the Vikings, masters of the sea and wind, the last of the barbarians. Today, modern archaeology and science are shedding new light on their origins and how they managed to dominate the seas and waterways of Europe. From the icy expanses of the north to the Russian steppe, these formidable Scandinavian warriors sailed the globe for three centuries, casting a wide net of trade and pillage. They built kingdoms and empires, but their origins continue to baffle archaeologists and historians around the world, the Vikings were exceptional explorers and sailors, surpassing all others in their time. Many people, including myself, understand the concept of a Viking as an activity, a characteristic. It's something you do, you go out a Viking. Today, the Viking legend draws men and women from all corners of the globe who reenact their epic voyages and battles. However, many sources tell us that Vikings were feared as ruthless pirates Gunnar Andersen, an archaeologist and curator of the Stockholm National Historical Museum's Viking exhibit, confirms that there are even some runestones that tell stories about him or her being a guard against Vikings here in Scandinavia. Today, modern science and stunning new discoveries are revealing who these Scandinavian adventurers truly were. The Swedes, Norwegians, and Danes spoke the same language and worshipped the same pagan gods. But it was their life-and-death relationship with the sea that defined Viking culture, before the Viking era, the Scandinavian populations buried their dead in ship-shaped stone graves called ship settings. These graves, such as the two on the windswept island of Erland, stand side by side with menhirs as entrances to the world of the dead. Far across the Baltic Sea, on the island of Sarima in Estonia, no less than 40 Viking warriors were excavated in 2011. They were buried in two bow graves. When the carbon dating results came back results were shocking. These were pre-Viking Age Vikings, making them pre-Vikings of the pre-Viking Age according to the Estonian calendar, the Vandal Age according to Swedish chronology, the bodies found in the Sarimar ships had been hacked to death. The battle they died in must have been major if 40 men were killed and enough survivors were left to bury them. We can see for sure that it was a battle burial ceremony. But there was a serious battle with more than 40 victims in two ships. The battle had to be hard. We can see vicious wounds on the skeletons, for example, hacked hands and broken heads. So, it was hard, and they had to bury those victims fast, the men who died on Sarima Island were buried with full military honors. Riley Almiai, an anthropologist, was amazed at the care with which they were laid to rest. The strontium isotope readings from the enamel of the teeth of the Sarimar warriors suggest they originated from Sweden around Lake Malarin. North of Lake Malarin lies Valsiurd, the heart of a thriving pre-Viking age Scandinavian community where noble men and women were buried with rich grave goods for centuries before the first recorded Viking raid. As we shall see, the massive Lake Malarin was the gateway to the Baltic for communities like these. Here, Ingmar Jansen found the best preserved pre-Viking age burial site in this part of Scandinavia. The first grave of this kind dates from about 600, thus the beginning of what we call the Vendel era. But anyway, it's just one man that's laid out like that, intact. All the other families, they lie in simple graves. You don't see them over there in a pile, cremated, these Vendel era boat graves were rich in artifacts buried with the dead, objects they believed would serve in the afterlife, including magnificent helmets. They give us an insight into the lives of these pre-Viking adventurers. And the mine lies in the middle of the boat, surrounded by his weapons. The Vendel era was a prosperous period, so they would bury three shields, and there would be other things too, such as drinking vessels, horns, and glass from France, and it shows how cremation and boat burial went together in the pre-Viking era. Noble women were buried with their typical oval brooches. There was a woman buried over there in a two-meter high mound. She was buried with glass pearls and bronze jewelry and so on. But the one thing that was so special was a little dragon head that must have been made out of some kind of ivory. A woman was the owner of the finest ship grave ever found. It was uncovered in a burial mound at Osberg, south of Oslo, and dates to the earliest part of the Viking Age. The ship now stands in the Oslo Viking Ship Museum, directed by Jan Bill. During the excavation, it became clear that even though there weren't two complete skeletons in the grave, it did contain the remains of two distinct individuals. It was also evident that they were probably female. This was confirmed by the osteological examinations, and they also confirmed that the remains were from an older and a younger woman. Archaeology confirms how ships were central to Scandinavian society and how rich men and women would literally take them to the grave. The powerful lady who owned the ship was in her 80s and was buried with a cart, a sledge, 
and a slave woman aged about 50 whose DNA can be traced to populations living around the Caspian Sea, the furthest east the Vikings ever went. Dendrochronology or study of tree rings revealed the ship's place of origin. It was only later when other dendrochronological examinations of two ship findings from Karma in West Norway were carried out that it was suddenly possible to find an exact match with the tree ring characteristics from the Osberg ship. When it was possible to demonstrate that the tree ring pattern seen in the wood from the Oseberg ship was the same that was seen in the ships and the grave on Karmali, then it was possible to state that the Oseberg ship must have been built in that same area of West Norway. The ship sailed for decades in the early 9th century before it was buried with the old lady of Oseberg. It was built here on Karmea Island, western Norway. Maritzva leads the excavations at Arvalds Ness, the seat of the first kings of the Northmen. The Nova Norway is named after a sea lane, and this Northway started here. When people in the olden days came sailing past the open Yaya coast, just when they turned north, Kamsund outside here is like a road of water. So this is where the Northway started. This is where the story of the first Viking raiders of the West started, the homeland of the terrifying predators of the sea, the story of the Vikings starts many centuries before the first recorded attack. The sea was the lifeblood of the Nordic communities that lived along these rocky shores of Karmoya Island in modern-day Norway. The Vikings here lived and died by their ships. The ship grave on its own is a manifestation, a communication with the gods in a way. It's almost like a theatrical play where you are connecting with the gods. And it wasn't like they made these graves in a couple of days. There were a lot of rituals, and they stood open several months. We can see that on the logs that we found in the graves, the sagas written in Iceland two centuries after the end of the Viking era record stories passed on orally by Norse poets from one generation to the next. And they tell of the first kings of Orwellsness. The last saga from Oval's ancestry was the king at Avalnus. He traveled all the way to Siberia, which the Norse people called Biamalan. There he met a Mongolian princess of Siberian ancestry, and to ensure the whale hunt trade, he married her and brought her back to Avaldnus. And so there was a dark-skinned queen here on Avaldnus, although for hundreds of kilometers northwards, Norwegian geography offers nothing but mountains and deep fjords, perfect for sheltering ships from the Atlantic gales but hopeless for farming. Here, local chieftains found a profitable way of exploiting the rocky coastline by extorting a tong from rich merchants passing through. They sent their ships out to control the sea traffic, and it is this channel outside of Valnus that created our wildness and turned our wildness into a center of power for 3,000 years. Point one has to be clear about the fact that voyages down to the continent from Sweden and Scandinavia were something that had been going on many years before the period that we call the Viking era. In that way, the Vikings only followed an already well-worn path. We know that the contacts between the continent and Sweden and Scandinavia were comprehensive and extensive already during the early irony evidence of ancient trade links with the east along Russia's rivers were found here on the shores of Sweden, where archaeologists found this bronze Buddha dating back to 750 AD. Yes, the little Buddha statue was found in the 1950s in a settlement on an island outside of Stockholm named Helio. It was found in a house there. We know that it was made in today's Pakistan in the Swat Valley and that it dates to about 400 years after Christ Helio and Berker were trading Emporia on Lake Malarin near Stockholm. Here on Adelson Island, on the other side of the lake from Berker, the local chiefs taxed and extorted protection. Money from traders and industrialists, creating easily disposable wealth that they could spread among their followers. There was a longhouse, a port, and reception halls as the seat of political power. It was built at a healthy distance from the industrial town where traders and craftsmen labored in grimy and filthy conditions, the layers of waste are so thick and there is so much garbage that lies inside these places. You must also remember that many of these places, first and foremost Burka, had no natural surrounding areas. Out on the farms, they removed the waste, they used it as manure for the fields and things like that. But in these places, that space was missing, other trading towns grew and faded away. In Norway, all that is left of Kopang on the shore of Oslo Fjord are a few mounds dating back to the earliest years of the Viking Age. As at Burka, here a powerful military elite tax trade in exchange for protection. What we can see in the whole of Europe is that when these early cities rise, they have connections to kings and the powerful. The connection can be indirect. Cities need protection, they need military protection because trade is not a barbaric thing, it's a peaceful thing, and tradesmen are mostly engaged in other things than war. They want protection, Kopang, on the edge of Norway's Oslo Fjord, actually revealed surprising cultural influences from the south and the first self-proclaimed king of Denmark. 
And in Kaupang, we look south because if we look at the Scandinavian jewelry in the graves in Kaupan, culturally it's a connection to the south. And what was there of powerful kings in the south of Scandinavia around the 800s? King Gottfried. King Gottfried was little more than a warlord based in northern Denmark, competing with others to control farmland and trade. He founded the trading towns of High Derby and Ribe on the very edges of the lands he controlled, taxing all those who traded in his realm. It was a violent way of life where workers toiled in miserable conditions and traders risked their lives on the high seas, suffering attacks but also pillaging themselves where they could, armed to the teeth and ready for anything. So, we don't have clear traces of plunder there. But at the same time, they did plunder other places. That's obvious. And we have some indirect traces. We've got pieces of ecclesiastic inventory from the British Isles where they had been broken off and robbed and made into the jewelry that we found lying in the graves, the most ancient power center found in Denmark was a chieftain's camp at Leiden, close to the modern city of Roskilde on the island of Zealand. The ancient burial grounds and the royal halls here date back to the late Iron Age and Viking Age. Scholars believe this is the place that inspired the old English epic poem about Beowulf, proving an ancient tie between the two lands. Tom Christensen has excavated here for decades and explains the ancient ties with England, what happens in England is that the Romans leave the island and then the German immigration begins, together with Danish tribes. We know that people from Jutland settled in Kent, for example. So there must have been cultural and perhaps also personal contact between the head of clans between Denmark and England, the legendary era kings here in Denmark were known as the Scholdings, descendants of Odin. The ancestral pagan gods legitimized the rule of the kings here, committing them to defending the old religion as long as they could. Was the son of Odin, so he was the son of God. It was quite common that the royal families created connections to the gods. As a baby, Skuld was sent on a ship to the country of the Danes. So a ship arrived from nowhere with this baby on board. Relations with the gods were necessary to be able to call yourself king. You had to have a godly descendant. And afterwards, we have got these stories, the Purana sagas, about the genealogy of the kings that were here. If the origins of Viking culture have been lost in the mists of time, today archaeologists and scholars are shedding new light on the Dark Ages in Scandinavia. Today we know very little about early Scandinavian culture, but the extraordinary Viking sagas written down 200 years after the end of the Viking Age did record the legendary feats of Vikings as repeated in poems handed down orally generation after generation by court poets, the Old Norse, the Old Norse sagas, the ancient Nordic sources, are from a later date. They are written down several years after the Viking era, and they are also written down by chroniclers in Scandinavia who were Christians and who lived in a Christian context and who wrote from their own Christian conception of the world, so to speak runic inscriptions show a common language between the inhabitants of Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. This non-standardized 16-letter runer alphabet used sound values inscribed on stone or wood by Scandinavians. Then there are the runic inscriptions, first and foremost in this part of Scandinavia, and they are contemporary. But they have their own special problems because the messages are often very short and concise. Really, they tell us nothing about society at that time, the rune stones were usually red, starting with the head of the dragon. But this one was different. Well, and here he writes, your girl and fast gear and Eric had this stone painted after their father, Vogar. Then there is an addition, F-R-E-H and their father. Something very special. Even after the Vikings had become Christians, the dragon remained a key feature of their culture and figured on runestones for centuries. The dragon painted on these runestones is generally tied in some way. Either there is a leash between the neck and the tail that binds the two together, or the leash is interwoven. Here it is interwoven, and therefore it is a sort of rule that if you follow this tail, for example, it goes over next time, under the leash, over, under, over, under, over, under, and it has to be like that all the way. So if the dragon tries to flee, it just gets tangled up, unlike parchment or paper, carving a rune stone left no margin for error. Then he cuts the runic inscription that is ordered. He cuts runes after runes, and at the end, he writes his father. He forgot the R. He must of course have an R. So the solution is that either he must cut an R here below, or he must place it inside the sentence. He then chooses to place it inside. And I know, being a rune carver myself, that when he discovered that he forgot the R, then he got so angry. It really bugs him. He pulled his hair. How could I do that? And the whole day is ruined, outside the Scandinavian world, churchmen wrote about the pagan Vikings as a scourge of God, 
threatening centuries of work building new Christian kingdoms to protect and propagate the faith. The pan-Scandinavian culture that was so threatening to the Christian world was cruel but effective. Only warriors who died in battle made it to the mythical paradise of Valhalla to fight during the day and feast by night. Here, the one-eyed god Odin ruled this warrior paradise with the aid of a raven and the Valkyries. Dead Vikings played board games that simulated battle. The fine game pieces found in the Sarima ships were carved with dragons, there were about 325 gaming pieces. Some were fragmented, but still, it's a huge number. And there were a few dice made from tusk. And in general, there are two types of gaming pieces. The game was called Nefertafel and was very popular in pre-Viking and Viking times. So this is a Swedish king who is the main character. Nefertafel means the king's table. So it is the king who is being attacked by the muskets, the enemies, the gods were not necessarily good. The Viking chief buried on Sarima Island possessed a luxurious jewel-encrusted sword. The representation of the canine god Fenrir tells us a lot about the early Viking beliefs. The dog's father, Loki, was a famous trickster, revered by pirates. Now here we have a very nice sword handle detail, and it's a bit different from the others. We can see a very nice symbol in the form of a two-faced animal. It is possible that it was the mythical hunter, the son of Loki, called Fendria, with a human face and animal hands, these characteristic grave goods reveal just how far the Vikings had penetrated the Baltic coastline and the plains of Russia and Poland. When a new motorway was being built here in central Poland, archaeologists made an unparalleled discovery in post-war Polish archaeology, a Viking Age cemetery with 50 human remains dated to the late 9th century. The graves contained a wealth of artifacts, including weapons, jewelry, and tools, providing a fascinating insight into the lives of the Vikings who lived and died here. The Vikings raided and traded all along the Baltic coast for centuries before they attacked England. And the Viking ships of Sam on Sarima Island in Estonia tell a tale of war and death. Riley Almiai is an anthropologist who worked on the Sarama skeletons, all gathered together in little grey boxes. Her job is to work out how they died that I think that during battle, he fell down. He was attacked from behind and maybe he fell down. He was fighting, probably because the cuts are in his right upper arm. But in my opinion, this upper arm or the hand was somehow fixed because you cannot make the strokes like this that they are in the same angle, more or less. And finally, I found. This calcaneus, one of the bones in the foot, I show you, which also means that he should have been lying or sitting or standing. So, it's a very strange situation. It's not a normal situation, the Vikings were not just warriors and traders, but also farmers and fishermen. They lived in a harsh environment, and their survival depended on their ability to adapt to the changing seasons and the availability of resources. They were skilled craftsmen, creating beautiful and intricate artifacts from materials such as wood, bone, and metal. Their ships were masterpieces of engineering, capable of crossing vast oceans and navigating narrow rivers, the Viking Age was a time of great change and expansion. The Vikings explored and settled new lands, from North America to the Middle East. They established trade routes that connected different parts of the world, bringing goods and ideas from far and wide. They left a lasting legacy in the places they visited, influencing local cultures and shaping history, but the Viking Age also had its dark side. The Vikings were feared and reviled by many of the people they encountered. They were known for their brutal raids and battles, and their reputation for violence and destruction is well documented in historical sources. Yet, they were also respected for their courage and skill in battle, and their stories and sagas continue to captivate us today. As we delve deeper into the world of the Vikings, we discover a complex and fascinating culture that continues to inspire and intrigue us. From their art and architecture to their myths and legends, the Vikings have left an indelible mark on our collective imagination. Their legacy lives on, not just in the physical remnants of their settlements and artifacts, but also in the stories we tell and the values we hold dear. And so, as we journey through the Viking Age, we are reminded of the power of exploration and discovery, the importance of courage and resilience, and the enduring appeal of a good story. The Vikings may have lived over a thousand years ago, but their spirit continues to resonate with us today, and that brings us to the end of our journey through the Viking Age. Thank you for joining us on this adventure. We hope you've enjoyed exploring the world of the Vikings as much as we have. Until next time, farewell.